Midnight Facts for Insomniacs. <laughs> I just learned something. Oh, I'm having fun now. What that looks like to me is, is sort of like a grain silo that somebody strapped a, a bunch of missiles to. Sergey, bring more bungee cord. I, <laughs> I have room for one more rocket. This looks like Wile E. Coyote shit right here. It does. It does. That is an Acme rocket if ever I had done seen to one. The ultimate Acme rocket because it's all the Acme rockets at once. Yes. <laughs> Duncan, I have an idea. Okay. I'm... Always mildly terrified whenever you say that, especially how you look at me. I have an idea. I have a maneuver. Uh, okay. Well, you know, <laughs> that just makes me hard. So what I'm thinking is that we have not done a mailbag episode in a while. Do you remember when we did? Yes, I do. I do. In fact, I think we even had an email for a while for a mailbag episode. We were kind of boomers. Oh, yeah. We did. Yeah. And I think we still, well, we still do. You could still email, I think, Insomniacs at Midnight Insomnia. Insom- I don't, fuck, I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> <laughs> Insomniac's inbox. Insomniac's inbox. inbox. That's what it was. At I think gmail.com. Right. You could d- try it and see what happens. Uh, we probably don't remember the password, so maybe don't. No, I have like a million inboxes on my phone, so I'm sure it's one of these. Mm. Uh, it'll come through. But it's probably not the best way to get in touch with us. Mm. You could do it through Discord. So uh, any questions that you have, if you want to know uh, Duncan's uh, girth or his uh, height, this is. From a comedy show that we watched the other yes. day. <laughs> I don't know the heights, and I don't know what girth, girth means. means. <laughs> <laughs> I love Brian Regan. He's funny. You spat your beer all over my... I did, because <laughs> I was not expecting that one line to be that funny, <laughs> and it over, caught me wrong. All over my carpet. I did. I did. And then you did offer to clean it up, but I was quicker, and I don't trust your cleaning abilities. Which is also fair. Look at me. I don't know. Where, where, what are we talking about? I fucking don't know. You started this <laughs> shit. I just follow. I'm like, okay. So mailbag. We mailbag. should do an yes. episode. If you, whatever you want to know. If you want to know how we, t- we've covered like a little bit about how we met and other things and mm-hmm. anything you want to know about us or this podcast or how it started. There's a lot of stuff that we haven't talked about in forever and we could cover it again. If you don't want to go back and listen to all that. 8 million episodes that we have so far. So yeah, any questions you have or any topics you want to explore or have us explore briefly on a mailbag episode, you can put in the Ask Shane and Duncan section and we just won't answer you there. We will answer you live and and in charge. It won't be live, but uh, I guess it could be. We'll be alive. We could do. Mm -hmm. You wanted to do a live stream of that? We can. I don't see why we couldn't. It's not a bad idea. Yeah. It will be live. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) By Duncan's decree. (laughs) Monkey say... Monkey say, and I guess podcast do. Yay. And I guess we can get on to this episode. I mean, can we? And we can. Duncan, I think you've mentioned before that you went to space camp as a kid. What did the whole thing consist of? Was it just a week of, was it basically a summer camp to get kids out of the way with like a space theme? Or was it you were like on the actual equipment and doing all the stuff? Some some of it, like, they did put you, they did strap you poorly into a gyroscope oh. and, like, spin you around. <laughs> My foot came out, and they had to stop the video because they, they do this whole thing where they, like, record little segments of you doing things at uh-huh. the camp just to prove to your parents that, that $5,000 or whatever they spent is well spent. That was evidence. Yeah. See, see, we did stuff. We didn't just take your money and run. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, they had to stop the recording with them, like, <laughs> my foot, like, swinging out in this gyroscope, and I was deathly afraid one of the rings was going to cut off my angle. Um, and then, yeah, we did other things, like, you know, build um, model rockets with, the, like, the little rocket engines in them. What? So, of course, half of our troop made them so they would explode. Uh, um, my resentment is building. I know. I, it sounds way cooler than I even thought it was. I mean... I did get the fuck up crew, so we were basically just but dumb it, little bastards. It's what you make st- it, though. Yes, you made it garbage, but it had the potential to be amazing. Yes, it had the yeah. potential to be amazing, and we made it tragic. <laughs> that's, that's actually more fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. And as we will learn, mm. uh, kind of consistent with NASA's track record. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, which yeah. Which we will discuss shortly because. This episode will be right up your alley. This is the history of space exploration. Ooh, this gets sticky real quick. The entire history. Yike. Remember when I said I wasn't going to bite off more than I could chew? Yes, in, you were too wily, I believe it was your exact <laughs> quote. Single episode? Uh-huh. Dope. <laughs> yeah, you're a moron. We could easily do an entire episode just on the Apollo program or mm. just on the development of rocket technology, but I'm going to contradict my own decree from last week and attempt to stuff the entire story of space exploration into one episode. It is a really bad idea. I agree. So here we go. Sweet. 
<laughs> the most important moment in the history of space exploration, according to me, was October 4th, 1957. Okay. It was important for a couple of reasons. The first is that until that day, no man-made object had been successfully launched into space. Hmm. So it was a gigantic milestone. Can you guess? Sputnik? You are correct. Mm. The second reason involves the who and the why. The who was the USSR, the former Soviet Union, and the why was to piss off America. Yes, uh, and, and you know, scare us a little bit, even though all it ever did was go bleep, 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 bleep. Correct. And that is uh, reductive, I guess, to say that it was just to scare us and piss us off. But ultimately, I think that's fair. It is tempting to view the space race as a noble pursuit, like two nations engaged in competition to advance the goals of humanity and expand our boundaries as a species. Get us off this rock. Mm. But in reality, it was driven mostly by petty one-upsmanship. Mm -hmm. The launching of Sputnik was a literal and metaphorical shot fired. It was a demonstration of technological dominance designed to prove to America that the Soviet Union was the world's premier superpower. And I guess to the rest of the world also. Right. This was the early days of the Cold War. Uh, since the end of World War II in 1945, there had been a tug of war between these two former allies and global superpowers. And the space race had become a proxy battle, the outcome of which would potentially signify and maybe even determine which country represented the future. If you could conquer space, you would have a huge strategic advantage in warfare because you could, like, attack from above. Mm. And you could also conquer the hearts and minds of the people of the world because perception matters. Truly. Initially, the United States was presumed to have the advantage. Americans had created the nuclear bomb, and for a few years after the war, they maintained their lead both technologically and in the number and potency of weapons and rockets. But there had long been concerns that the Soviet Union was advancing quickly and catching up in the arena of scientific education, just pumping out more and better trained scientists, and Sputnik seemed like confirmation of America's greatest fear. Yeah, except again, it was essentially a basketball with car antenna strapped to it. It was, but you still can't overstate the emotional and psychological effect that the launch of this satellite had on the American people. For the three months that Sputnik maintained its orbit, there was like a new star in the sky. It, it felt to many Americans like they were under the surveillance of a flying eyeball, like an all-seeing star with a, with a trailing chunk of rocket that was actually visible from Earth. Americans could look up at the sky with some binoculars or occasionally even the naked eye and track its movement across the heavens. Hmm. They could also capture its radio transmissions. You mentioned how that sounded. Not the most menacing sound, I guess. No, but I'm pretty sure Skrillex could turn that into a sick beat. <laughs> Probably. It's not like number stations or something in the sky, but just knowing that this thing was hovering in the air above the Earth was terrifying for most citizens. Mm -hmm. The monotone robotic beep of what seemed like a flying snitch was an oppressive, persistent reminder that America was no longer the undisputed world heavyweight champion when it came to technology and exploration, and that the Soviets could now insert themselves into our daily lives in ways that we could not prevent nor control. It felt like Big Brother was watching us. Mm. Big Brother. For the first 25 days after the launch, the New York Times ran an average of 11 breathless, alarmist stories per day about the Sputnik satellite. Here is Steve Bales, he'd become a NASA flight controller, describing his memories of Sputnik from when he was a boy. Hmm. We were in a Cold War, we were worried about nuclear exchanges, we were worried about what might happen, because it easily could have happened. And then all of a sudden, there's this beeping ball going around above us that nobody can get to, nobody can stop. People can see from time to time, there were little... Uh, broadcasters say, hey, go out and look at this time. You can see a little glimmer of light. People tried to do it. I never could, uh, but others did. It was, and here it was, beep, beep, beep. And then about a month later, I believe, they sent a dog into space. So not just can they send a piece of iron that can beep and send an animal into space. And we think, are we that far behind? Spoiler alert about the dog. I hadn't gotten to that yet. Mm. Uh, but as we will learn, the Soviets not only beat us to space, but also became the first nation to commit an orbital animal abuse atrocity. Yes. Not the last, though. Oh, no, definitely. Not by a long shot. Mm -mm. I do love how humans reach a new frontier and immediately taint it with unspeakable travesties. <laughs> I, like, I mean, what did you expect us to do? It's like, wow, so much new territory to be awful in. Yay! 
Anyway, we will get to Laika in a minute, but the so-called Sputnik crisis kicked off a space race that would culminate with Neil Armstrong taking the first steps onto the surface of the moon just 12 short years later. And when it comes to exploration and achievement, nothing in human history has eclipsed that accomplishment. For all that we've achieved since with the Columbia shuttle and incredible space telescope technology and the International Space Station, we arguably reached the pinnacle of human achievement, not just in space exploration, but I would say in any discipline, on July 16th, 1969. Hmm. So more than 50 years ago, humans broke the yoke of gravity and then propelled themselves to a new celestial body. And BTW, yes, it actually happened. <laughs> I'm not going to spend any time debunking the dumbass moon landing conspiracy theories because we already talked about it in our conspiracies episode. Yeah. And frankly, I cannot sanction that buffoonery. Amen. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in this episode, we're going to assume that water is wet and that <laughs> Neil Armstrong walked on the moon because we are goddamn adults. And instead of wasting time with nonsense, we will explain how space exploration evolved, why it stagnated in the wake of the moon landing, the rise of private industry, and the current state of space exploration. Yes, please, backup truck. And now we're actually going to get started with the episode. That was the preamble. Good. Nothing quite like an, a nice wordy prologue. This is going to be fun. Now, the space race was actually an offshoot of the race to make an intercontinental ballistic missile, an ICBM. So at its core, it was really a rocket race. Rockets, as you might have heard, are what you currently need in order to get to space. Yes, so instead of being inspired by a sense of adventure and the desire to go where no man had gone before, we were actually inspired in the space race by the prospect of killing our enemies way better than they could kill us. Yeah, faster, stronger, more splodier. Yeah. That has traditionally motivated uh, many human accomplishments, sadly enough. Well, yeah, you, you want to be able to kill the other guy better, so mm -hmm. you research the ever-living shit out of it, and then occasionally nice things happen because of that. So the space race starts with World War II. The first rocket ever to travel to space debuted in 1942. This was the Nazi-designed German V-2 rocket, a long-range guided ballistic missile powered by liquid propellant and designed by the notorious-slash-famous rocket scientist Werner von Braun. Here is von Braun after the war, explaining very casually how the V-2 came into existence. Hmm. And by the way, I thought it was Werner von Braun. Hmm. Always. No? Because of, like, uh, Eva Braun? Yeah, no, I got that. Yeah. It's not. No, no. It's on Brown. Brown. But it's spelled Braun. Yes. So don't call me out. <laughs> Which is traditionally my job on the show, is to call you out. I was just uh, anticipating ah. that either the insomniacs or just the way you were looking at me. I don't know. Uh, I don't like your face. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it when you pre-clench. Like, dude, no one's coming at your, your pink holes. Relax. It's, the reason I actually am saying that is mm. because I was listening to a podcast and the guy kept saying Werner Von Brown and I was like snickering like this guy's a real idiot. And mm. then I listened to a bunch of other stuff and I was like, ah, it's fairly consistent. Oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah. I'm the idiot. Mm -hmm. Throughout 1940 and 41, the components of the V2 were developed and captive tests were carried out. But up to the first successful flight of the V2, we really never had any high-level support for the V2 program. The thought was widespread, and Hitler himself felt that way about it, that this would be impossible to build a thing like the mm. V2. Now, after we demonstrated that the thing did work, all of a sudden we were directed to go into mass production. I love how cavalier he is. <laughs> So after the Fuhrer decided that we should do this thing, uh, we did this thing. And then we bombed a lot of people who had done basically nothing to us. Also, it's great that it turns out the real problem with Hitler was that he was a rocket skeptic. Yes. Von Braun seems very miffed about that fact. Yes, or, or at least as mildly miffed as, as Germans are allowed to show. He's not as concerned with the man's other transgressions. No, no. This is the real problem was yes. that he was... Uh, he dared to doubt my genius. A naysayer. Yes. Um, I also love that he... he has to have been the guy who inspired the voice for the little short fat doctor in uh, Captain America who mm. follows around the Red Skull because he sounds just like dude. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. He has to. He kind of sounds like every minion Nazi that you, they've <laughs> ever seen in movies. Thank you, Doctor. Exactly. <laughs> so the V2 looks like a Looney Tunes rocket. It is the rocket you're picturing when I say the word rocket. Right. V2 stands for Vengeance Weapon 2. Uh, this machine seemed like something created by a James Bond villain. And the reality behind the production of the V2 is consistent with that analogy. The rockets were produced and built in Nazi concentration camps with slave labor. More than 10,000 people died during the production process. 
And Von Braun definitely knew that. I love that he just got to be interviewed casually after the war. So after we were done killing most of the Jews, the ones we didn't kill, we made them build the bombs that killed the British people. So, you know, it was a very interesting time. So thousands of people died in the V-2 production process, and of course thousands more were killed by the rockets themselves. The V-2 could strike without advanced warning because it was capable of traveling into the upper atmosphere and then descending at supersonic speeds, faster than the sound waves that would have signaled its approach. Right, or the radar that we just recently developed. That too. Uh, These rockets were devastating because they were essentially stealth weapons and the Allies had no effective defenses against them. Yes, uh, I think the only plus side of the V-2 was the fact that it was notoriously next to impossible to aim. The original ones were. Later versions would actually be guided by radio signals, a.k.a. guide beam technology. Mm. So once they added that, it was even scarier. Yeah. Each V-2 weighed 13.5 tons, and the propellants included alcohol and oxygen and steam created by vaporizing hydrogen peroxide. The explosive power was generated by a mixture of TNT and ammonium nitrate. These things were incredibly effective, very lethal, and extremely advanced for their time. In fact, the first test flight of the V-2 on October 3, 1942, reached an altitude of 52.5 miles causing the head of Germany's rocket program to announce, quote, this third day of October, 1942, is the first of a new era in transportation, that of space travel, unquote. Hmm. Which was not technically true, or at least was debatable, because the Kármán line, where outer space technically begins, at least by sort of semi-consensus, starts uh, 62 miles up. Hmm. But uh, no one was going to argue with a guy who had a whole bunch of V-2 rockets. And, you know, the SS. Hmm. When Hitler was finally defeated and World War II came to a close, the Americans seized a large portion of the German rocket program, including Werner von Braun himself. Mm -hmm. The Soviets were sort of left to pick up the scraps, but they were able to cobble together some V-2 rockets and reverse engineer some of that technology. And for the USSR, this was extremely important because by the end of the war, much of Russia had been decimated, including their young male military age population, their military and industrial resources. Uh, They were at an extreme disadvantage. Yeah. The United States, on the other hand, had not faced any battles on home soil. Plus, America had created and was mass-producing the nuclear bomb and had positioned A-bomb-carrying aircraft strategically in allied countries around the USSR, like Turkey and the UK, which would allow them to strike fairly quickly. Yeah. Even when the Soviet Union began finding success with their nuclear program, they did not have the capacity to attack quickly nor deliver those payloads as far away as the United States. So rocket technology became a huge priority for the USSR. Their goal was to create intercontinental ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads that could travel extended distances to strike American targets. Yeah. So the Russians began focusing on rocket propulsion technology, and they turned to a rocket scientist who had been imprisoned by Stalin, Sergei Korolev. Korolev had been considered a danger to the communist regime, along with most academics and intellectuals. But now that he was suddenly deemed useful, Stalin had him released from a gulag to work on the rocket program. I'm so sorry, comrade. Come this way. We will give you vodka and new rocket to play with. Oops. <laughs> Oopsie. Our bed. You know, sorry, like uh, alphabet. Very difficult to understand. It, it looked like English letter flip mm. around. And so, yes, sometimes we miswrite things. Yes, but they were supposed to give you a writing implement mm. uh, instead of a pickaxe. Yes. Sorry. Mm. The result of Korolev's release would be the R-7 the first intercontinental ballistic missile in history, designed by Korolev and based on the German V-2 rocket. Mm. Meanwhile, the United States, comfortable in the knowledge that there were strategically positioned American bombs arranged around the Soviet Union, felt that they had the luxury to focus on non-military space-based goals. In July 1955, the United States formally announced that they were planning to design rockets capable of sending the first ever satellite into space, and that this goal would honor and coincide with the so-called International Geophysical Year. Had you heard of this before? No. This was like all over my research, and I had never heard of this thing. Hmm. It was basically an informal agreement among nations to drop hostilities over scientific exploration and share information and resources with the goal of uh, benefiting all of humanity for one year. <laughs> So they called a timeout for one year. Exactly. And we're just like, so we will all totally give each other information then, yes? Mm. Of course, no meaningful secret technologies that could actually benefit a rival country had any hopes of being shared. Yeah. The Soviet Union responded to America's announcement only four days later by basically saying, us too. (laughs) And the space race was on. 
The Soviets began repurposing their missiles as spacefaring rockets. And meanwhile, the American army, in a project led by Werner von Braun, began producing so-called Redstone rockets based on the wartime V-2 designs that were pioneered by von Braun himself. Hmm. But there was a competing program in America as well. The Navy took a different direction, proposing a new type of rocket for multi-purpose use, one that didn't have as much potential for negative publicity because it hadn't been used against the Allies in war. Yeah. This was the Vanguard rocket program. And Eisenhower chose to go with the Navy's Vanguard version for a variety of reasons, probably not the least of which was the fact that there were far fewer former Nazi war criminals heading up the Navy team. You do say far fewer because there had to be at least one or two. There probably were. Yeah. Let's be honest. Operation Paperclip was kind of (laughs) widespread. Mm. There were none of the stature of uh, von Braun. Yes. No high level Nazis. No one who was doing interviews. No. And mentioning Hitler left and right. Yeah. As though he were, you know, a drinking buddy. (laughs) Yeah. It probably was. Mm, That's fair. Plus, I think another thing that Eisenhower liked is that the Navy version was completely new and would not be associated with death and destruction. It wasn't based on the V-2. Which is, you know, solid. Mm -hmm. A solid uh, miscalculation. (laughs) (laughs) Those are our favorites. Ended up being a terrible idea. Okay. Because this decision would prove fateful and cost the United States their advantage. Hmm. Back in the USSR. Nope. Are you going to do it? Nope. Not going to have it. Back in the USSR. Mm -hmm. No? Mm -hmm. No? You're doing great. Led by the newly freed Sergei Korolev, Soviet rocket scientists were hard at work repurposing the R-7 series to carry a satellite into orbit. Americans did not realize it yet, but the Soviets already had a huge advantage because, as mentioned, the R-7 rockets were based on military ICBM designs and thus were capable of carrying heavier payloads into space. They had initially been designed, obviously, to carry nuclear warheads. Right. Which are not light. I hope so. I don't know. Suitcase bombs are a thing, I guess, but... Now they are. You don't need a then. lot of plutonium, I think. But yeah, back then we just watched uh, Oppenheimer. It was a big yeah. old. That was a big honking bomb. Well, right, because you needed focused explosions to make things happen. Mm-hmm. And back then we didn't have as good explodies. I mean, if you think about though how big it is compared to the explosion, it's a really tiny little bomb for what it does. Yeah, but also plutonium and and uranium and those kind of things also aren't the lightest of metals. No, but I mean, you don't need a lot of them. No, that's yeah. true. So while the United States initially planned to send up a satellite weighing only a few pounds, Sputnik would be around 200 pounds, thanks to those beefy R-7 rockets that were capable of handling that weight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The Sputnik launch, however, did not go exactly according to plan. So to envision the R-7, imagine a tall, thin cylinder surrounded by a Native American teepee-like structure made out of four smaller rockets that are kind of leaning against the big one. It does not look remotely practical. It's like something a kid would draw and other kids would make fun of. (laughs) I will post it in the Discord. If this thing were in a science fiction film, I would legit LOL. (laughs) Look at Sergey's rocket. It's so dumb. That would never fly. It is the stupidest. You can't draw. Who allowed this to happen? (laughs) Uh, I'll show you the R7 rocket. It's like someone was like, how can we make a rocket really powerful? And they're like, why don't we just strap a bunch of other rockets to a rocket? How do you make a rocket better? More rocket. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, what that looks like to me is is sort of like a grain silo that somebody strapped a, a bunch, bunch of, of missiles to. Sergey, bring more bungee cord. I <laughs> I have room for one more rocket. This looks like Wile E. Coyote shit right here. It does. It does. That is an Acme rocket if ever I had done this seen to one. The ultimate Acme rocket because it's all the Acme rockets at once. Yes. <laughs> So this weird mashup rocket weighed 280 tons. It was 112 feet tall. It was a two-stage rocket. So for anyone who doesn't know, each stage of a rocket is a separate segment. And each of those segments is designed to be detached. So the first and biggest stage is the base of the rocket. And when its fuel is depleted, that stage is discarded. And then the next stage typically ignites and burns through its fuel. So rockets can have three, even four or more stages. But the R7 was relatively simple. Mm -hmm. The point of these stages, by the way, is to reduce the weight as the fuel is depleted. Obviously, the burning of the fuel reduces some weight, but as the fuel disappears, you still have the now empty fuel container adding unnecessary bulk. So the most efficient strategy is to deplete the fuel and then jettison the fuel container. Yes, which is, you know, what our modern shuttles do now, which, you know, the solid rocket boosters fall off and then the big center tank falls off. Right. You want your rocket to be as light as possible so that you can achieve the incredible speeds required to push through the atmosphere and break away from Earth's gravitational pull. 
Right. It's not an easy task. No. The speed and force necessary to get into space is known as the escape velocity. And depending on trajectory and the atmospheric conditions, typically averages around 25,000 miles per hour. That is 11.2 kilometers per second, or about 7 miles per second. So, not slow. I'd vomit. I mean... I'd definitely black out. (laughs) But mostly just out of, you know, terror. (laughs) Absolute pants-shitting terror, (laughs) yes. And it would be a welcome oblivion. Yes. Very similar to me in a suit of armor, just a place I shouldn't be. Right. Why am I here? Why did anyone give this to me? (laughs) So back to the partially botched Sputnik launch. It is honestly kind of a miracle that the mission succeeded. First, the engines did not fire on time, and then 16 seconds into the mission, a fuel regulator on the booster failed. Sputnik ended up orbiting at around 500 miles above sea level, below its intended elevation, Mm. although the height above sea level varied along the course of its orbit. At the apogee, or farthest point away from the Earth, it was around 583 miles, and at the perigee, or the lowest point in its orbit, was around 134. Yeesh. So a lot of wobble there. Yeah. Kind of yo-yoing at us. Yeah, that is not what I would call a stable orbit. I guess that also explains why some people could see it at night and some people couldn't, depending on how close it was to you. Right. Sputnik was initially intended to orbit Earth once every 101.5 minutes, but ended up at the speed of around 18,000 miles per hour, circling the Earth once approximately every 96 minutes. If a satellite is orbiting exactly over the equator, it has an orbital inclination of zero, and will only be visible in the same narrow band of sky throughout its lifetime. But if it is tilted in any way, it then wanders around the sky following different paths throughout the duration of its journey. You can kind of envision this if you picture a string going around the Earth, and if it's a little bit off axis, eventually you're going to end up with like a tennis ball of string. Right. And then, you know, it looks sort of like it's drunkenly listing across the sky if you speed up the time. Right. Yeah. Because of the 65-degree tilt of Sputnik's orbit, it would eventually fly over just about every inhabited area of the Earth during its three-month lifetime. Mm. So everyone had the opportunity to be creeped the fuck out. As mentioned before, the satellite itself was too small to be seen by the naked eye. It was a round, polished ball only 23 inches in diameter, but it was trailed by the core stage of the rocket, which was large and visible. The radio transmissions from Sputnik's antennas could be picked up by pretty much any standard shortwave radio, so this satellite was not intended to be stealthy. It was intended to make a statement. Right, and that statement was beep, beep, beep. The United States was blindsided by the launch of Sputnik, and then the American citizens once again executed a collective spit take less than a month later, on November 3rd, when before the United States could mount any meaningful response, the Russians went ahead and launched Sputnik 2, carrying the first live animal to ever orbit the Earth. Not the live. (laughs) It was uh, live in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Most things are. (laughs) So we finally reached Laika, the first animal in orbit, although notably not the first animal in space. Hmm. The first live animals intentionally launched into space were fruit flies sent into space by Americans on a V-2 rocket in 1947. Fruit flies are genetically similar to humans, says the internet. Hmm. I don't believe you. Look it up. I did. (laughs) (laughs) That's your response? Look it up. I did. (laughs) So when the fruit flies returned to Earth intact, Mm. without the radiation of space having altered their genetic makeup, researchers were convinced that humans could survive the trip. Mm. If a fruit fly can do it, so can Jim. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know if I like this logic. (laughs) Yeah, this this logic (laughs) seems faulty AF, and, you know, Jim's kind of fucking stupid, so, you know. I'm not a scientist, but I feel different than a fruit fly. <laughs> you are aging like a fruit fly. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum has something to say about this. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it is... Bzzz. Anyway, the first animal that actually orbited our planet was launched into space on Sputnik 2. This was, as mentioned, a dog named Laika. And we're not going to talk much about this one because I do not really want to. Hmm. I feel like we had enough science perpetrated dog murder in a previous episode. Yep. All of you traumatized insomniacs know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, it's the episode that shall not be named. This was right up there with the polar night of the ponies when it comes to creating even more insomnia for our unfortunate insomniac listeners. Can you still hear them, Shane? The cries of the ponies. What will it take to make them silent in you, Shane? It's heinous. (laughs) And it's sadly anytime I see a pony now. Yeah. Miffy has ruined ponies for me. Yeah, I can't even listen to genuine music anymore. It's just, you know. No. Rim shot. Boom. So we're not going to dwell on this, but suffice to say that Laika was a stray Samoyed terrier mix 
who was chosen from a pool of 10 dogs. She was the lucky winner. And her prize for being adorable was the honor of being shot into space and murdered. Yay, humans. Sacrificed, I guess would be a, a better word. Yeah, I guess. Sure. Incidentally, sacrifice is the only time when cuteness privilege tends to backfire. Yeah. Whether it involves being sacrificed to the gods or a, or a dragon or the sun or whatever, the preferred victim always seems to be the most innocent and virginal and cutest. Yes. This is why, as mentioned before, uh, I have dedicated my life to being corrupt and ugly and slutty. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> I don't know if it's been working for me, uh, but I have yet to be sacrificed. And uh, it's been kind of a fun ride. Yeah, I'm, I'm calling it a win myself. The Russian word Laika actually translates to Barker. So it's possible that she was chosen for different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's fucked up even for Russian. That was, we, we couldn't exactly name her annoying bitch, so uh, Barker was the closest we could get. I think I have an idea of why she was chosen out of the 10 yes. dogs. Yeah. yeah. I love dogs, but there are a couple that I have lived next to that I would be happy to launch into space mm. because they were little Lycas. Yes. They didn't stop liking all night long. Yeah, I would have a, a Lyca to kick a few of those in my life. <laughs> <laughs> the rim shots are coming in hot. <laughs> I got you covered. Laika had also been chosen because as a stray, it was assumed that she would do a better job of surviving in harsh environments. I mean... Which might be the most depressing sentence I have ever uttered in my life. Where did you find this dog? Uh, around dumpster. Perfect. Put in space shuttle. This dog has spent her life in like some of the worst environments on Earth. And managed to survive. <laughs> What's the only environment worse than any environment on Earth? <laughs> <laughs> Not on Earth. Hold my beer. We mm. can we can outdo bad luck. Yeah. I mean, it would be really, hold my vodka. I can do better. And then strap in small, small dog. Yes, is, I think, what you're looking for. Yes, yes. But this is interesting. In 1998, a Soviet scientist who had worked on the project said, quote, the more time passes, the more I'm sorry about it. We did not learn enough from the mission to justify the death of the dog, unquote. Wow, nothing quite like fucking killing an animal and then admitting you did it for fuck all good reasons. Like, Jesus, bro. I mean, at least there was some guilt and regret involved, mm. I guess, and some honesty. But, yeah, he's just like, in case you weren't clear on exactly how tragic this was, let me really make that point. Grind this puppy home. Oops. Oh. So I feel like we have to cover the topic of animals in space because it has been such a vital element of space exploration. But we're just going to skip around here and there. We're definitely not going to talk about all the animals that have died in space. This would be a much longer episode. Mm. Uh, let's just say that the late 1950s was not a good time to be a monkey or a dog. No. Those were the most frequent victims in the first days of the space race. And America was just as guilty as the Soviets. At least 32 monkeys have gone to space. The first was Albert II in 1949, who took off from New Mexico and died on reentry when the parachute to his capsule failed. That's not really dying on reentry. That's dying on impact. <laughs> <laughs> True. That's not reentry. Already, already had happened at that point. Yeah, he had reentered and he just kept entering. And yes. if he had then maybe he entered the ground, if he had entered a little less aggressively, yes, he would have been okay. Two other monkeys, Albert the Third and Albert the Fourth, also died when their rockets failed. So obviously, stop naming them Albert, you assholes. Maybe stop sending Alberts. Yeah. Clearly, <laughs> Albert doesn't know how to pull his fucking chute. Like, why are we destroying this one family? Like, what? Can we stop trimming this particular tree? <laughs> it is now a stump. <laughs> Entire successive generations of Alberts bit Gone. the dust. Yes. Yeah. Quite, rather hard. I would say at Mach 5. At least 32 monkeys in total have visited space. Uh, many stayed. Mm. Sadly, chimpanzees have also made the primarily one way voyage. Mm -hmm. A mouse was launched into space on the 15th of August, 1950. He did not survive the return journey. Mm -hmm. I'm shocked it survived the launch. That yeah. poor little thing probably had a heart attack on the way up. I mean, yeah, I, I can't imagine there are that many, it would take that many G forces to just kill a mouse. Yeah. Mm. Or I don't know, maybe being small and compact, you actually handle the G forces better. I don't know. Mm. A total of 12 dogs were launched into space in the 1950s. Some survived, so yay, I guess. Yeah. Other animals that have been to space, uh, tortoises, frogs, fish, ants, jellyfish, beetles, moths, a uh, spider. That one was particularly interesting because there was a debate about whether a spider could spin a web in space. Spoiler alert, they can. Yeah. Although I think that would be pretty funny if they couldn't. You just see a spider like spinning in space, like spitting out web from its butt, just flying everywhere. Midnight fact. Yeah. Spiders can uh, navigate zero G. 
Or, you know, microgravity. It's That's really more microgravity. Great to know. It's great yeah. to know that no matter where we go... <laughs> Spider, I, I will be creeped the fuck out. Space spiders. That's what I. That's what I needed in my life. I, I, Thanks for that. I'll sleep well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if this show should even exist. <laughs> On occasion, I have those moments myself. I'm just like, what? Why would you do that to me, you asshole? So many of these facts are yeah. better off remaining not known. Yeah. Apparently, spiders don't blink, and they can navigate microgravity. Fun shit. Here's another uh, fact I don't want to know. The first animal to give birth in space was a cockroach. In 2007, a cockroach named Hope birthed 33 more cockroaches on a Photon M satellite. And then they promptly pressed the button and it exploded, and they still lived. <laughs> yeah. It's great to know that pests will accompany us as we expand across the universe. Yes. Thanks. Yes. Great job, scientists. You guys are really killing it on this episode in so many ways. <laughs> in so many. <laughs> Your own room shot. Well done. Literal ways. <laughs> The French sent a cat to space in 1963. The cat survived the trip and then was dissected to examine the effects on her brain. Wow. That, I don't know why, but that strikes me as terribly, terribly French. <laughs> if you want a positive note, uh, plenty of animals have been returned safely to Earth, and we'll mention at least a couple of them later. I swore for a second you're like, if you want a positive note, find another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> we don't do that here. <laughs> the positive notes are few and far between and underwhelming as that one was. Yeah. Hey, Insomniacs. Just a reminder that for as little as $3 a month, you can join Patreon and get bonus episodes, access to live video streams of after midnight shows, plus a ton of other perks. And of course, everything we release for patrons is 100% ad free. Just head over to patreon.com slash MFFI to support our podcast. Now back to the show. So back to our story. The Soviets had now launched two satellites with no response from the United States, and President Dwight D. Eisenhower was desperate to score a win. He pressured the Navy to speed up their Vanguard rocket development, because if there's anything you want to rush, it's the development of delicate, complex, explosive, and highly sensitive machinery. Yes. The Vanguard 1A satellite was launched on December 6th, 1957, and soared triumphantly four feet into the air, 1.2 meters, and then unceremoniously crashed to the ground as the TV-3 launch vehicle that was carrying it uh, sputtered anticlimactically after two seconds of flight. Wow. That is an impressive fail. On the plus side, the radio transmitter of the satellite still worked, so it was easy to locate the tatters of the broken satellite in pieces on the ground. Good, good. I mean... Silver lining. I was going to say, I'm pretty sure they had cameras back then, so they could have just looked. The cause of the failure has still not been conclusively determined. Hmm. But if I had to guess, I would say hastiness and hubris. Those elements were at least involved. H&H &H every time. The failed launch was a huge black eye for America, and our space program quickly became an international source of amusement. The media nicknamed the rocket Kaputnik, Flopnik, Stayputnik, and Dudnik. I mean, Dudnik is pretty good. I like Stayputnik. Stayputnik is also <laughs> pretty good. The failure did have two silver linings, though. Yeah, uh, we figured out how not to make a fucking <laughs> rocket. <laughs> <laughs> what not to do. <laughs> hmm. No, one uh, that it prompted the Eisenhower administration to pump a ton more money into space exploration, leading to the creation of NASA in July of 1958 and the National Defense Education Act, the NDEA, which likewise injected money into the American education system with the focus on the sciences. Hmm. And number two, the launch failure also made Eisenhower desperate enough to turn to the former Nazi Werner von Braun and give his Redstone rockets the go-ahead. This was the Explorer program. And it would finally give the United States a taste of celestial success with the launch of Explorer 1 on February 1, 1958. This first American satellite was only 30 pounds, so a fraction of the size of the much more substantial Sputnik due to the American rocket's lift limitations. Mm -hmm. In fact, if I'm being honest, the whole thing was a little bit of a letdown. It's just not super exciting when your competition has already successfully launched two satellites and then you're finally able to brag that you managed to get one to not explode. <laughs> the Explorer program would result in five satellite launches, two of which failed to achieve orbit. Not a stellar track record. Mm. And that pattern of consistent failure, punctuated by occasional uninspiring success, would extend through most of the late 1950s as the result of further boomsplodes in both the Explorer and Vanguard programs. Fabulous. 
Meanwhile, while the U.S. flailed and failed, the Soviet Union would quietly and successfully launch Sputnik 3 in May of 1958, a research satellite, and following a flurry of American failures in October of 1959, the USSR's Luna 3 became the first ever craft to photograph the far side of the moon. So at this point, the Soviets were firmly in the lead in the space race. Yeah, kicking ass and taking names. They were space daddy. Wow. Yeah, we were space baby. I I got that. (laughs) The United States was able to achieve a string of minor successes at the dawn of the 1960s, becoming the first nation to send a craft to another planet when the Mariner 2 made it to Venus, or at least cruised within about 35,000 kilometers of Venus. Hmm. But the next big milestone would once again be achieved by the Soviets, who, with the Karabal Sputnik 2, managed to finally return animals to Earth successfully. Hmm. Dog buddies Belka and Strelka made it home in August 1960 just a few months before John F. Kennedy was sworn in as U.S. president in January of 1961. We chose to go to the moon, not because we want to, but because fuck the Russians. We'll get there. All right. As a presidential candidate, Kennedy had campaigned on returning America to glory by defeating the scourge of communism, and he knew that getting his ass continually handed to him in the space race was not a good look. No. So he tasked Vice President Lyndon Johnson with finding a way that America could conclusively beat the Soviets in at least one big space race milestone. Johnson consulted with NASA Administrator James E. Webb, who surprisingly felt that the best option would be the one that would result in his organization receiving the maximum amount of funding. That's weird. The goal of putting a human on the moon. Mm. So Vice President Johnson returned to Kennedy with his recommendation, and at this point, the situation was dire. Just a few months after Kennedy's inauguration, the Soviets had once again humiliated the Americans by becoming the first nation to send a human into space when Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin successfully orbited the Earth in April of 1961. Mm. He traveled on the Vostok 1 spacecraft, which spent 108 minutes executing one orbit of the Earth and then re-entered the atmosphere, and Yuri parachuted to safety. The Vostok 1 was not appealing. It looked like a very janky light bulb, almost like a Christmas tree light. Mm. And it was not much bigger than one. He was basically stuffed into a tiny little spy satellite. I think that's what it actually was, kind of a hollowed out spy satellite. Right. This was, of course, another gigantic embarrassment for the United States because the Americans had been working diligently on a project intended to launch the first human into space, a project which was officially called, and before you accuse me, I am not making this up, Man in Space Soonest. What? (laughs) That was the name of the project. Who, okay, whoever named that shit needs to be posthumously slapped in the fucking head. I love it. (laughs) They'd finally a project that's not like Project Titan of the whatever. You know what we need? Mm. Man in Space Soonest. (laughs) Simple, to the point, tells the story. What are we calling this project? Hey, look, we ain't got time for this shit. All right, it's Man in Space Soonest. Let's get to work. (laughs) (laughs) Done. And apparently they didn't save enough time with the name because they still lost. Yeah. The U.S. all about epic self-owns in the 1960s. Dude. The race had been very close, though. The following month after Gagarin completed his successful mission, America responded with the Mercury program, specifically Mercury 7, sending Alan Shepard on a suborbital trip 116 miles up aboard the Mercury Redstone 3 rocket. Shepard is uh, kind of a character. Hmm. There are some great quotes from this guy. My favorite is that, uh, quote, when reporters asked Shepard what he thought about as he sat atop the Redstone rocket waiting for liftoff, he had replied, the fact that every part of this ship was built by the lowest bidder, unquote. (laughs) I remember that quote. (laughs) And I feel you, dude. Seriously. Shepard also started the tradition of a steak and eggs breakfast for astronauts on launch mornings. Hmm. He additionally had a glass of orange juice, which he would come to regret during the three hours long launch delay. Mm. Shepard eventually complained that he needed to urinate and was told that urinating in the suit would be unacceptable because of the electrodes and sensors attached to his body. He finally told Mission Control that they would need to turn off the electrodes because he was going to do his business no matter what. So they did, and he did, and then about an hour later, 45 million television viewers watched Shepard rocket into space with a lap full of dried urine. Wow. Majestic. That is... (laughs) You were just talking about self-owns. So he basically became intergalactic Captain Pisspants. Mm-hmm. Cosmic Piss Boy. <laughs> <laughs> I say Piss Boy. <laughs> the Soviets would launch two more humans successfully into space with the Vostok 3 and 4 craft 
in August of 1962, and those missions would be the first to keep humans in space for multiple days, uh, three days and two days, respectively. Yes, but did they have pee in their pants? I guarantee they did eventually, at some point. At some point, because entered pants, I got it. I've done a lot of scuba diving, and when you got to go, you got to go, and you're not going to, like, take that damn thing off. Mm. And I'm, I guarantee it's a lot harder to get into a spacesuit. That's fair. So beaten at every turn by the Soviets, President Kennedy felt like he needed a Hail Mary. It was go big or go home time. And nothing was bigger than the moon. Except the sun. And or, or every, Mars. Every planet in our solar yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. But those planets were much harder to get to. Yes. Or they were like uncomfortably warm or uncomfortably cold or raining acid. <laughs> so the moon would have to do. Look, there were problems, all right? <laughs> there were issues. And this was how John F. Kennedy ended up heading to Congress on May 25th of 1961 and announcing his intention to shoot for the moon, so to speak. Mm. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. So that was Kennedy's very normal sounding speech announcing the moonshot. But the most famous version of Kennedy speaking about the moon was the so-called we choose to go to the moon speech at Rice University on September 12th, 1962. You referenced it earlier. Mm -hmm. Officially titled the address at Rice University on the nation's space effort. It's less fun. Yeah. This was Kennedy at his most inspiring question mark. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. <laughs> that, the other thing. You know, the thing the, with the stuff that goes doink. This is the weirdest, most absent-minded speech. I don't, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do those other things and maybe a, a few things I haven't even thought of yet. And lunch. Ah, where am I? <laughs> Woo, so drunk. Where's my motorcade? <laughs> things Jeez. could not get worse. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> clack, clack. To say that Kennedy's speech was a bold pronouncement would be an understatement. But also, keep in mind that this was only 1962. He was giving himself almost a decade, and oh, by the way, Kennedy would have to win re-election to even see his goal to fruition. So he's kind of making a case and campaigning for his re-election at the same time. Yeah. Not to mention that American presidents are limited to eight years, or two terms, so he wouldn't even be president when the clock ran out. Even if he won re-election, uh, Kennedy would have to leave office in 1969, and if America had failed to reach his goal, the next guy would have to deal with the fallout. So he basically primed the grenade, dropped it at somebody else's foot, and ran off. Yeah, so Kennedy gets a ton of credit for this bold pronouncement, but it was also just kind of a low-stakes boast that he would never really have to back up himself. Mm -hmm. Just like Kennedy, I too enjoy setting goals and making promises that I will not personally have to fulfill. Yes, I know. It's my M.O. Yes, that's why <laughs> I have to do a host swap, you mm -hmm. dick. <laughs> Sometime in this decade, Monkey will have to do a host swap, which he's going to hate. Maha, maha, maha. So now that Kennedy had set the agenda for approximately a decade of space exploration, the next step was a simple matter of figuring out how to design a rocket that could make it to space with multiple people on board, carry them 238,000 miles further than any human had ever gone into space, somehow manage a soft landing on a hard rock, launch again, cover another 238,000 miles, and deliver them safely home. I mean, you probably could have just stopped it further than any human had ever gone. Mm. Full stop. Yeah, so, you know, no biggie. Nah. Just figure it out, scientists. <laughs> Off you fuck. I've done my part. Right. I made a speech. <laughs> Do you have any idea how hard it is to write a speech like that in my cadence? Why is this taking so long? How many decades could it possibly take to accomplish one tiny little goal? Now I'm doing like a weird Jewish accent. Yeah. I don't even, it sounds offensive. <laughs> you kind of veered into like New York Jew and it was interesting, but. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's why I try not to do the accents in this podcast. It's a good. We'll leave yeah. that to. Mm. Some monkeys grind organs. This monkey does accents. Oh, I grind your organ, baby. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that doesn't sound pleasant at all. <laughs> I'll whittle that thing down to <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Hand me that potato peeler. <laughs> uh, we're getting a little punchy. This is good stuff. Well, right. This is taking a long time. Yeah. yeah. We still got a long way to go. Oh, good. Good. 
Over the course of the next year, there were a few different options considered by NASA. One involved launching a giant rocket that would deliver the astronauts to the lunar surface and back while remaining largely intact. Another option was launching a similar rocket in two separate pieces that could then be assembled in space. And the final and most outlandish proposal was to launch a multi-component rocket that would enter into orbit around the moon, split in two, and one portion would shuttle a couple of the astronauts to the surface while the other stayed in orbit. Then that landing craft would once again split in two, and the top half would launch back into space, somehow meet up with its orbiting buddy, recouple, fly back to Earth, and split apart once again before a splashdown. NASA chose that option. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like the best way to do it, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Known as the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, this was an incredibly complicated and patently ridiculous idea that ended up being the only one with a chance in hell of working. Yeah, yeah. So it took a year just to decide on the mission plan and the basic spacecraft design. Twelve months spent arguing and debating, and NASA still hadn't built a single component, and they had fewer than seven years to go. Hmm. So time well spent. Yeah. Yeah. To make matters worse, now that America had thrown down the gauntlet, the Soviets knew exactly what the United States was planning to do, and as you can probably imagine, they had no intention of sitting idly by and being space cucked by America. (laughs) Not that they had much danger of that, considering the recent past. So both countries decided on a plan and started taking literal moonshots. The Soviets achieved a soft landing on the moon first. This was with an unmanned craft, but uh, still, things were not looking good, and Americans began bracing for another failure. Mm. The situation got even worse in January of 1967, when America's first exploratory test mission resulted in tragedy. Apollo 1 burned up on the launch pad during the warm-up for a rehearsal flight, killing Roger B. Chaffee, Gus Grissom, and Ed White. Yep, I've walked around that launch pad. It would be pretty heartless to qualify this next fact as a silver lining, and no American or American politician would say it out loud, but you know they were thinking it. The Soviets experienced their own tragedy within the same year when the Soyuz 1 crashed to Earth on April 24th, killing cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov. This was actually the first human space travel fatality because it happened off the ground. Mm. Americans celebrated internally. Sure, sure. I, I can't prove that, but come on. Yeah, I know that. Both space programs, however, would rebound as a succession of Soyuz and Apollo launches inched closer and closer to achieving the kind of results necessary to realize the ultimate goal of a crude moon landing. Crude being uh, C-R-E-W-E-D. Yes. But kind of of both. Yeah, I was going to say column A, column (laughs) B, now that I'm thinking about it. But time was running out, and Kennedy's promise wouldn't actually be fulfilled until the very last year of the decade, 1969, with the launch of the legendary Apollo 11 space mission. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty amazing story, and somehow I didn't really know the full extent of it. So how much do you know about the Apollo 11 mission, Duncan? Mm, That it happened. (laughs) It's a start. (laughs) Yeah. Very accurate. Yeah. I cannot (laughs) disagree with that uh, that statement. I know you can't. How about the Saturn V rocket that took them to space? Uh, I was big and black and white. (laughs) So unfair that you went to space camp. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. I didn't know anything more. So, I mean, it's yeah. fine. <laughs> but there are a lot of kids that did, and they didn't get to go. <laughs> so the Saturn V rocket was a beast. It was a three-stage rocket over 360 feet tall. And the astronauts, Neil Armstrong, Edwin E. Buzz Aldrin, and third wheel Michael Collins, were situated at the very tippy top of the Saturn V in a minuscule command module that was shaped kind of like a tiny Hershey's Kiss. Yep, They were like the cherry on top of the banana split if the banana split were oriented vertically and massively explosive. And packed with enough explosives to level a building. You might remember that there was one even tinier structure at the very tip. It was like a needle at the end of the rocket. Mm -hmm. That was the launch escape system. It was attached to the command module, and in the event of an emergency, it would be able to jettison the command module away from the rocket like an ejector seat. Hmm. It's a good thing it was never needed, because any minor technical difficulties would most likely have resulted in the entire structure going mushroom cloud. Yeah, and at very least the death of all involved. An ejector seat is kind of pointless if it's ejecting a bunch of ashes. (laughs) An ejector seat is also kind of pointless if it injects you into the fireball. That too. This would have been an epic boomsplode. In fact, every launch was an epic boomsplode, just a very controlled one. The Saturn weighed 6.2 million pounds, and approximately 4.5 million pounds of that weight was fuel. It was a flying bomb. Mm. 
Side note, keep in mind that when we talk about fuel, we also have to include oxygen. Oxygen is required for any incineration or fire or explosion, like the ones that propel the rocket forward, and in space there's no oxygen, which means you have to bring your own oxidizer, adding to the weight and subtracting from the amount of traditional fuel you can carry. Right. The design of the Saturn V was the result of repurposing the very best Nazi technology at the direction of the preeminent space Nazi himself, Werner von Braun. The thick base of the Saturn rocket housed five F-1 engines, thus the name, which lifted the rocket off the launch platform and disengaged it from the launch umbilical tower. Yes, that is the real name of that thing. Mm -hmm. The bottom stage of the rocket was officially called the S-1C, and it would take 12 full seconds of its engines firing at full power for the rocket to clear the platform. As it rose into the Florida sky, the rocket picked up speed, and the astronauts would be subjected to four Gs of pressure four times the normal gravity, flattening them into their seats. Two and a half minutes into the flight, a.k.a. 42 miles in the air, explosive bolts would be triggered and would sever the base, that's stage one, from the other two stages, and the base would peel away, spinning down from space and crushing some porpoises and maybe a shark or two in the Pacific Ocean. Right. NASA will take any opportunity to pointlessly murder some animals. (laughs) It's not science unless some animal dies, duh. So now stage two would ignite. This was the S2 module powered by five smaller J2 rocket engines. Nine minutes into the flight, we're now 109 miles up. The second stage would likewise be discarded and the third stage would briefly ignite. This was the S4B powered by a single rocket engine. Hmm. As mentioned before, the further you climb into the atmosphere, the smaller the amount of thrust that is needed because you're moving away from the grip of Earth's gravity. So each successive stage of the rocket can be smaller and less powerful plus less power is needed because the remaining stages are lighter after burning through a bunch of fuel and jettisoning the previous stages. Yes, and also less atmosphere equals less drag equals less fuel. The firing of the third stage propelled what remained of the rocket, I think of it as the circumcised rocket, into a parking orbit. Just the tip. So Apollo 11 orbited the Earth a couple times, and then when the perfect trajectory was achieved, the engine fired again and propelled the astronauts to the moon. Now that the rocket was in space, only the tiniest amount of thrust would be needed to get the rocket the rest of the way. Basically, Newton's first law of motion takes over. An object in motion stays in motion until it crashes into a giant space rock. (laughs) Or adjusts its trajectory at the last minute. So it only slightly crushes itself. Or, you know, skims across. Right. At this point in the flight, the third stage was no longer needed, and so the S-4B also peeled away... But this maneuver was different from the others. This is the first of the maneuvers that I have come to think of as space acrobatics. Hmm. Uh, My jaw legit dropped when I watched a video simulation of this. So imagine that the rocket is hurtling toward the moon. The protective panels at the tip of the rocket peel off, exposing the lunar module. This is the self-contained vehicle that is going to shuttle the astronauts to and from the moon. The command and service modules at the very tip of the craft which are connected together and kind of look like a metal dreidel, Mm -hmm. uh, they detach and then flip around and attach themselves to the lunar module to draw it out of the S-4B before the S-4B is then discarded. So now what started as a 300-plus foot tall rocket has been whittled down to an extremely awkward-looking tiny hunk of weirdness, a space dreidel attached to a four-legged metal stick insect. (laughs) So the arcing path of the Apollo 11, which was still essentially in a very wide Earth orbit, had been calculated to intersect with the moon in its orbit in four days, six hours, and 45 minutes. The precision required for these calculations is intense. And we're talking about calculations being done on basically those like TI-95 calculators from high school. Yeah. That's not completely fair. NASA did have some giant mainframe computers, but those computers had far less processing power than a cheap laptop today. Yeah. And I mean, let's also just not forget the fact that these are massive calculations designed to get somebody from point A to point B on what could be considered the longest and most boring road trip ever. I don't know how boring it was. It was like boring punctuated by absolute terror, punctuated by discomfort and flop sweats. (laughs) Misery. And piss pants, let's be honest. (laughs) It's fair. The Apollo Guidance Computer, or the AGC, was installed in the command module. It had two kilobytes of RAM. Woo! To put that in perspective, the iPhone 14 has six gigabytes of RAM, or three million times more RAM than the Apollo computer. Yeah. 
So the Apollo reached the moon on schedule and jumped into its orbit. And then the lunar module separated from the combined command and service modules, or you might say the stick insect broke free from the space dreidel. The lunar module carrying Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong then descended to the moon. And this was a harrowing flight. The module came in hot, both metaphorically and literally. Mm. And it turned out that the chosen landing area was too rocky. So Neil Armstrong had to take manual control and steer this thing as it hurtled horizontally and at a slightly downward trajectory, staring through the little triangular windows and firing the jet engine in front of the craft to slow its descent. Mm -hmm. These men had nerves of steel. And balls that clanked. And a mean right hook, as we learned in another yes. episode. <laughs> of course, Armstrong managed to find a suitable landing spot because he was a goddamn badass. Mm -hmm. And he famously informed Houston that the eagle has landed. Which my father always, for some reason, said with a German accent and made it sound very Nazi-ish. I guess there's some justification for that. Yeah. Neil Armstrong became the first man on the moon some six hours later and spoke the famous words, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Supposed to be one small step for a man, but he kind of flubbed it a little bit. Yeah. And then Buzz got to play second fiddle. Yes. But still pretty sweet. Yeah, I mean, second fiddle to the only fiddle on a small planetoid, still pretty sweet. And poor Michael Collins was stuck back in the Columbia control module, just twiddling his thumbs and... Wondering whether the mission was going to go full Titan submersible. Yeah. You, <laughs> you want to talk about getting space cucked. That's, that's getting space cucked. <laughs> right? That's the <laughs> worst. No, you wait up here, Miles. Why? Because. Because I hate you. Because I hate you. <laughs> so Buzz and Neil used their 21 hours on the moon to collect moon dirt and a bunch of rocks and take photos, and which would later become fodder for conspiracy theorists. The flag stiffly waving in the non-existent breeze was actually supported by a rod to keep it erect, or else it would have just hung there. And those weird shadows totally don't make sense unless you understand even the basics of lighting and the fact that the surface of the moon was mildly reflective. We're just, we're not going to go down this road again. No. We don't want to get punched by Buzz. I mean, stands to reason nobody wants to get punched by an old man. Especially not that badass old man. No, no. The astronauts also took a phone call from Richard Nixon. So, yay. Which is probably the saddest part of this entire story. No one really talks about that anymore. No. I'm sure they wish it had been someone else hmm. or that they had not answered. <laughs> New moon phone. Who dis? Who dis? <laughs> anyway, the astronauts hopped back in the lunar module. And in another display of ridiculous complexity, the lunar module now split in half with the bottom portion, the legs of the stick insect, also known as the descent stage, being abandoned on the moon, and the ascent stage, which of course had its own propulsion, this is like nesting dolls made of bombs. Yeah. Just layer upon layer of complicated machinery, and each layer of which has its own little boom explode. <laughs> so the ascent stage ignited and took off, uh, knocking over the American flag in the process. That is a true thing. Whoopsie! Climbing back into space, the lunar module rendezvoused with the control module in yet another display of acrobatic space flippery. <laughs> the ascent had to be timed perfectly to intersect with the orbit of the command module, and it took around four hours of adjustments and maneuvering to achieve the rendezvous and docking. Oh. The lunar module ascent stage, the upper body of the insect, was now abandoned, and the service module, which is the part of the dreidel that you would hold and spin if this were an actual dreidel, fired its own boom explode. Just <laughs> everyone, everyone gets a boom. You get a boom explode. You get a boom explode, and you get a boom explode. And then jetted back toward Earth. And just leaving more freaking space garbage out there. Well, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of it. So, you know, why not? Once Earth orbit was achieved, another transformer moment occurred as the service module peeled away, leaving only the tiny Hershey's Kiss shaped command module with three very ripe, unwashed astronauts who had now spent approximately eight stressful, fierce, sweat soaked days in space. Yeah. So if you're picturing the command module as a Hershey's Kiss, the flat side is now aimed toward Earth because this is the all-important heat shield made of fiberglass honeycomb impregnated with a phenolic resin attached to a stainless steel shell. Yep, yep, yep. No, take their word for it. Sure. As the command module entered Earth atmosphere, it began to glow red and essentially caught fire. It was a plunging fireball that looked like a streak of flame searing across the sky. Which I'm sure wasn't stressful at fucking all, especially since it's not controllable. 
that's uh, when there would be a lot of dried urine on my, oh, a lot of not dried urine. I was going to say a fresh. Nice, fresh urine. Nice, fresh, warm urine. And probably mm. other stuff in my pants. Too. Yeah. <laughs> when the command module reached two miles altitude above sea level, three parachutes were deployed, and the giant Saturn V rocket had now been whittled down to a tiny nub of little command module housing three weary and heroic and once again very stinky astronauts. Yes, yes. The module hit the water, and boom, success. Oh, I thought you were going to be like, and boom, everybody died. <laughs> History got it wrong. No, this was a success. America. America. Suck it, Soviets. <laughs> we can say that because the USSR doesn't even exist anymore. Yeah. So there's no one around to suck it. Which is so, sad. Always tragic. <laughs> So, yeah, it is wild that this fucking craziness worked. Yeah. That's not even the right word. It's just insane. You could almost say it's inconceivable. When you add up the cost of the Apollo program, it comes to over $25 billion, which is just under $200 billion in today's money. Mm. Going to the moon ain't cheap. But once again, I would argue that this was the most impressive feat humanity has ever accomplished. So, worth it. Yeah, I call it a win. So after the success of Apollo 11, NASA was feeling cocky and ambitious and began developing very lofty goals. Their plans for the next decade included multiple space stations, as well as orbital fueling and docking facilities to gas up and repair a fleet of spacecraft. There would be space tugs, which were just what they sounded like, celestial tugboats to haul gear and spacecraft around. Mm. And there was even a concept designed for a nuclear rocket engine known as Project Minerva. It was a very optimistic time. And over the next couple of decades, all of those high-altitude ambitions would come crashing to Earth, along with many of the spacecraft that NASA attempted to launch. Yeah. Strangely enough, NASA's one big post-Apollo win, the space shuttle, arguably the most complex craft ever built, and that is saying a lot after the Apollo 11 mission, mm. was almost an afterthought. NASA realized that their imaginary George Jetson future required a craft that could shuttle people and supplies to all of those elaborate space stations and to the moon and potentially other planets. The space shuttle itself was considered one of the least ambitious and almost perfunctory elements of NASA's future blueprint. Hmm. Yet it would become their second biggest triumph after the moon landing, and it would define the space program for the next 30 years. Wow. There were a few reasons that NASA's grand ambitions had to be scaled back. Uh, first, they had basically shot their metaphorical wad with Apollo. Having set this incredibly challenging goal for themselves and then achieving it, there was not an obvious next step. Mars was out of reach until probably the early 2000s, by NASA's best guess, and all of the logical next steps would be seen as anticlimactic and boring. Mm. Building a space station or a permanent lunar base that might have sounded sexy when satellites were impressive, but now that there wasn't a literal moonshot to aim for, everyday Americans had sort of moved on didn't help that NASA kept returning to that moon well. Uh, Saturn V launchers facilitated 10 more lunar landings over the next decade, which, I mean, cool? Mm. But it's kind of like a magic trick you've seen before. Right. You, you only get better at spotting when the card gets palmed. Yeah, like we were still learning valuable information from each new trip into space, but that simply was not obvious to the average coke-snorting bearded disco Dan in the 1970s. <laughs> and of course, NASA also ran into the fiscal wall that was the brutal recession of the 70s as well. Yeah. The famous and famously Tom Hanks documented failure of Apollo 13 further eroded support for NASA's Apollo programs. Meanwhile, the Russian space program literally and metaphorically sputtered as well. The Soviets worked diligently on a series of space stations, achieving slow and iterative and mostly uninspiring results. If you're a huge space geek, I guess this stuff is probably exciting, but for the average person, it just did not have the panache of the moon race. Right. America launched their own version of a space station, the less than stunningly successful Skylab, in May of 1973, which required immediate repairs and eventually crashed to Earth in July 1979 after a respectable but less than scintillating six-year run. Hmm. The 1970s did see some successes, with the Soviet Union beating America to Mars, landing the first uh, successful Mars probe, Mars 3, in 1971, but the probe self-destructed immediately after touchdown. It would be followed five years later by America's Viking landers, two probes that successfully touched down and provided years of data. Hmm. China, by the way, is the only other nation to have landed uh, craft successfully on Mars. Really? Okay. 
the United States and the Soviet Union actually began working together on a combined mission toward the end of the 1970s. It involved a physical and symbolic combining of the Soyuz and Apollo craft, so the two spacecraft would dock together in space, and Russian and American astronauts then shook hands. It was obviously intended to symbolize the ramping down of the Cold War and a future of cooperation rather than competition. This happened in uh, mid-1975. With the election of Ronald Reagan, five years later, the Cold War ramped up yet again, and so America would go it alone, launching back into the space race solo with the shuttle program. Hmm. So let's briefly talk about the shuttle, which was definitely the most recognizable symbol of NASA throughout my childhood. Did you ever have like a little uh, shuttle figurine? Yeah, my uh, brother was obsessed with building models, and so he would build World War II models like, you know, Japanese Zeros and P-51 mm-hmm. Mustangs, and I'm pretty sure I remember him building a space shuttle. Yeah, that was like the coolest thing when I was a kid. I see. I didn't know much about the Saturn V and Apollo and everything, but the space shuttle was pretty damn cool because yeah. it was like a plane and a spacecraft, and uh, it also uh, blew up a lot. <laughs> At least once that I know of. Twice. Oh, really? Oh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about it. So one thing I've never understood is why you couldn't just build a plane that has a rocket engine, get super high up in the atmosphere, kick that rocket engine on, and jet off into space. Aren't they planning to do that very thing with with ramjets? Uh, Well, no, and I still don't fully understand, I'll be honest, but it has to do with the fact that planes are designed to use the atmosphere and air pressure to fly. Mm -hmm. And the type of engine that you would need to push your plane into space, as well as the types of controls that you would need to, like, successfully maneuver once you got there, those are just incompatible with plane technology. Mm. There have been a lot of attempts and sort of hybrid vehicles, and the space shuttle basically was one of those. It was a hybrid vehicle, and we'll talk about it. To a lesser degree, you run into this problem if you try to fly a plane back from space to Earth. There is a reason all of the previous spacecraft had returned to Earth by using the intricate and graceful technique of crashing into the ocean. (laughs) However, while the challenges of building a plane that can fly to space and back seemed insurmountable with current technology, a hang glider was another story. NASA figured they could probably create a plane that would glide back from space if they could just get it there in the first place. And that was the origin of the shuttle. The shuttle is lifted into space on a traditional rocket, but it glides back into the atmosphere and then fires its engines and lands like a plane would. Yep. What most of us think of as the space shuttle is actually the space shuttle orbiter. This is the plane-looking part, uh, not including the rocket that initially gets it to space. The rocket itself is made up of three components, two solid rocket boosters that burn solid fuel, and one giant traditional fuel tank in the middle. But the Space Shuttle Orbiter itself actually has 49 engines. There are the three that we all recognize as those large black bells grouped together at the rear of the craft. Mm -hmm. But there are 16 in the nose alone and various other small engines that fire to aim and maneuver the craft. Right. Those three big engines were great for a liftoff and propulsion. But once the orbiter was in space, it had to switch over to smaller engines that can provide targeted thrust for navigation. Yeah, little bursts of like aerosol air essentially. It's a very complicated piece of machinery. Yeah. The primary and perhaps the most important feature of the orbiter was the payload bay. This is what the orbiter was built for. It's why this thing was called a shuttle, because it was built to carry cargo. The payload bay was 60 feet long and 15 feet wide and carried valuable gear into space, including the Hubble Space Telescope and equipment for the International Space Station, which was built beginning in 1998. Hmm. The space shuttle did have two very public and very devastating setbacks. You probably remember both, but anyone of our age will certainly remember the first one. The Challenger disaster of 1986 was traumatizing for Americans of all ages, but especially for children. Yeah. I remember watching it live as a kid in school, and it was probably something I should not have been watching live as a kid in school. (laughs) The reason it was being broadcast in so many classrooms was because there was a teacher on the shuttle, if you remember. Yep. Krista McAuliffe, just a standard civilian who had been given the opportunity to visit space in order to drum up publicity for the mission and for NASA and to hopefully reignite American interest in the space program. And it did. Kind of not great. Ignite is the right word. Mm -hmm. In case you were wondering, for all of our complaints about the backwards communist regime, the first woman in space was a Soviet cosmonaut named Valentina Tereshkova, who flew her first mission in 1963, orbited the Earth 48 times, and to this day is the youngest woman in space and also the only woman to fly a solo mission. America would not put a woman in space until Sally Ride in 1983, 20 years later. 
So the next major shuttle disaster would be the explosion of the Columbia in 2003. I don't know exactly how I didn't know about this. I feel like maybe because we were still in the shadow of 9-11 or something. Oh, wait, is this the one where, like, essentially, like, ice fell off and, like, bapped into something and caused it to explode later? Uh, well, I don't know. All the passengers were killed, yet again. Mm. And this essentially led to the retirement of the space shuttle program. Uh, they let it kind of limp along until it successfully finished the final construction phases of the of the International Space Station. Mm. And then they were like, and that's enough. Sit down, Grandpa. You've, yeah. you've, you've done your job. Yeah, you did your job uh, sporadically. And also occasionally combusted. Yes. Yes. But, you know, two failures out of however many times it went up, that's still a pretty good failure rate. Tell like, that to the 14-something people. Well, I mean, I wouldn't want to be one of them, but still, I mean, people c- crash more cars or more planes than that. I don't know. I mean, I'd be interested to know, like, the number of people who drive cars versus the number of astronauts there are. Like, what's the actual percentage, percentage yeah. of pe- astronauts who get killed. Yeah. I feel like you have more of a chance of getting killed. Based on what I've learned of these two <laughs> space programs, yeah. being an astronaut, not a lot of longevity in that profession. No, no. The retirement plan is either very hit and miss. Mm. Yeah. So what is the current state of space exploration? Well, NASA is planning to land the first man of color and the first woman on the moon by 2024. This is Project Artemis. And I get the historic nature of this, and I do feel like maybe it's necessary, but it kind of feels like checking boxes. And obviously, it is not particularly groundbreaking beyond the diversity aspects. Right. I would honestly rather see people of color and women be the first to go to Mars or break new ground rather than just playing diversity catch up. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of the shittiest reparations ever. (laughs) Yeah. Like, yo, you want to risk your life and almost die? Sweet. Off you go. And just follow in the literal footsteps of other white people who came before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Meanwhile, as most of you probably know, non-governmental private companies have been moving into the space race. Elongated Muskrat and his SpaceX, uh, because the man thinks the letter X is just so fucking cool. (laughs) Maximum X. Uh, He's 12. I mean, mean, so am I, but like, (laughs) at least I don't have billions of dollars to waste on my stupid 12-year-old bullshit. (laughs) <laughs> and, of course, Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin. Ironically, all of those companies have reverted back to rockets. They're not doing space shuttles anymore. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying there haven't been some advances, but if you look at SpaceX's uh, rocket Starship, quote-unquote, it's an almost 400-foot-tall two-stage rocket that takes off from a launch tower. It is just 100% an upgraded version of the Saturn V. Right. The only difference being that it can pilot itself and land itself. No, you're thinking of the Falcon 9 rocket, probably, Mm, mm. which is a very nice looking rocket that once again is still an old school ass rocket. Now, the one very cool, innovative feature that we have seen, and I have to give Musk credit here, is that the Falcon 9's first stage booster, after it separates from the second stage, has successfully reoriented itself and landed so that it can be reused. That is not the same as a rocket going all the way up and coming back down and landing itself. Right. Still pretty cool, though. And yet, watching these explosive, fuel-heavy liftoffs, it feels like we've stepped back into the past and we're trying to pick up where we left off after the moon landing. Like we've lost the future that we could have had. You know, mm. NASA had such ambitions. And yeah. They weren't funded and, and maybe were botched a little bit. Yeah, I mean, when you're, when you're underfunded, overworked, and keep fucking shit up like the Hubble telescope or mm. the first Mars lander mm. or, you know, there were things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I am a huge science fiction fan. And in the 1990s, I would have thought that we would have a space elevator easily by like the 2000s. Yep. Just some kind of geosynchronous space station parked above the earth with a giant metal cable that would allow us to lift objects and people into space and then transport them off planet. But we just have to scale back our expectations, I guess. Yeah, if we barely have jetpacks now, the that's still a ways off. We had jetpacks a long time ago, if you remember. Just, yeah, again, but not Iron Man jetpacks. We now have pretty explody. Yeah, still pretty explody. Yeah. There may still be some exciting advancements on the near term horizon. We know Muskrat wants to go to Mars, and Blue Origin is touting their orbital reef from their website. Quote: Orbital Reef will be the premier mixed use space station in low Earth orbit. It very much looks like a Wi Fi router. Was not blown away. No, probably not. The inside's pretty cool, if it comes to fruition, which, mm, mm, again, skeptical. Yeah. 
So NASA is still limping along, and private companies are stepping in to ferry millionaire tourists to space. It is not the future I hoped for, but it is the future we've got. Is that a depressing enough note to end on? I'm pretty sure it is. Have we hit uh, sufficient uh, rock moon bottom? (laughs) Rock moon bottom? (laughs) (laughs) That statement was depressing enough. (laughs) Well done. (laughs) We are done. (laughs) Holy crap. There was so much more we could have covered. The future of space exploration should be an episode of its own. Apollo might actually end up being its own episode because there was just a lot of drama that I did not get to. Yeah. It is an amazing historical event. We could do an entire episode on the V2 rocket. Like, all of this stuff is just huge. Yeah. Uh, But this is what the Insomniacs picked. So here we are. (laughs) Blame yourself. (laughs) I like to blame our fans and listeners. Yes. Maybe maybe if they start hating us, they will stop listening and we'll never have to do another three-hour episode again. (laughs) (laughs) Unlikely at this point. And we thank you for that always. No. I love you guys. And it's only uh, only an hour and, and change. It's basically two hours. A lot of change. Yeah. So much change. We have a new minion. Yes! Meet Chris24420. Okay. Pretty sure that's a stoner thing. <laughs> what was your first clue? Just a shot in the dark. <laughs> just, a, just a spliff in the dark. And a new menace. Hmm. Meet Merida Jones. Merida Jones? Merida Jones. M- Mrs. Jones. Is that a, is Mrs. That a song? Mrs. Jones and me. Yeah. That's... No, that's not the song I was thinking. Oh, like the sexy Mrs. Jones song. Oh, Mrs. Jones. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. She deserves more of a sexy. It's not, not, not Mr. Jones. It's a, let's not misgender oh, Marita oh. Jones. I don't know. Merida might be a guy's name. Yeah. Now I'm, uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop before I put my foot any further into in, my mouth. Yeah. You know. Yeah. All right, you guys know the deal. You know that time is of the essence uh, because I am falling asleep and uh, it is late where we are. So please get out there, go to the Instagram, get onto the Discord, go buy some merch. And send us stuff for the mailbox episode. Please. Uh, Join our Patreon, go to Instagram. If you want to see what we look like, that is interesting. Some people will be like, I didn't know that there were pictures of you guys out there. They're not just pictures. We have some videos uh, from our live stream episodes and things. So you can go there, check those out. You can join the Patreon from there. And uh, you can, again, hit us up for the mailbag episode on Instagram, through our email, via Carrier Pigeon, whatever works for you. Thrown rock, try not to hit us in the head. Mm. Generally, windows are good. Laden swallow. <laughs> how how much can it carry? African or European? Mm. Mm. And then, <laughs> as per usual, <laughs> and forever after. Knowledge is power. Sleep is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>